Stanford University. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn, for that, that uh, no dean jokes. I appreciate that. Um, thank you all for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Usually I come here as a, a spectator, learning a great deal. Of course, I'm not an energy scientist or, ener or engineer, but it's really a great opportunity to participate um, today. Of course, a hard act to follow after the amazing visions for our energy future from Dr. Xi and, and Dr. Johnson. Um, my talk is going to be more focused on how to implement that energy future in ways that doesn't have, in ways that uh, don't have unintended consequences. Um, as, as Lynn mentioned, I come really from a world of uh, research, earth sciences research focused on climate change focused on sustainable agriculture, and focused in this broad and emerging field of sustainability science. So I tend to think about energy from a sustainability perspective. In today's talk, I'm going to suggest that making good energy choices, those choices that have more co-benefits and fewer unintended consequences, is key to our sustainability transition. And then I'm going to ask what knowledge and tools and approaches are available to help us make good choices, to help decision makers make good choices, and what more should we in the research community be doing to help. Now before I get to that, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about um, or defining sustainability because of course we have lots of different definitions. In, uh, in industry, we talk about the triple bottom line or three E's. Uh, economy, uh, environment, and equity. But the definition that I use is one of the definitions from the National Academy of Sciences, and it's really a statement of goals, of a dual goal, of meeting the needs of people today and in the future, our needs for energy, food, water, shelter, education, employment, and so on. At the same, while at the same time sustaining the life support systems of the planet. And by that I mean our uh, water systems, our atmosphere, our climate system, and the species and ecosystems on land and in the oceans that provide so many of the goods and services that we need to survive and that, human, uh, that future generations will need to survive. So it's a very simple, um, very straightforward statement of goals but it is really, really challenging. And just to give you an idea of how challenging it is, um, it is true on the meeting the needs of people side that things have gotten better, uh, more infant mortality rates are declining, lifespans are increasing, more people have access to education and health care today than ever before, and yet there are a billion people who can't read, mostly women. A couple of billion people without access to sanitation or safe water a couple of billion people without access to modern forms of electricity or energy, and a billion people go to bed hungry a lot of the time. Um, and that's just today. Population is still growing. We're expecting it to level off around 9 billion people or so by the middle part of this century, so we have their needs to worry about as well. So big challenge there. Also a very big challenge on the life support system side. We have changed the atmosphere in many ways, including through the emissions of greenhouse gases, that, um, especially through our activities of fossil fuel burning and land use change, that are affecting climate, that are acidifying the oceans. We've converted more than half of the ice-free land surface of the planet, changed it completely, with uh, effects on biodiversity, which we're losing at 100 to 1,000 times faster than background rates. 60% uh, of the services, goods and services we receive from ecosystems are in decline. We have water resources limitations all over the place and so on. So it's, it too uh, uh, is cause for concern. Unfortunately, these dual goals of meeting the needs and protecting the life support system of the planet are often or have been in the past inversely related. Now, if you work on agricultural sustainability the way I do, you realize that we've worked very, very hard to include, increase food production over the last half century or more. And we've been successful, but in part because we've used a lot of fertilizer and 
water and so forth. And use of fertilizer carries with it a whole set of unintended consequences that affect our atmosphere, our water resources, biodiversity, and so on. And of course, the same thing when we talk about energy. They're, it's the source of most of the uh, water and, and marine and soil pollution, a lot of it that we have on the planet. It's the source of most of the greenhouse gas emissions. And that has a whole cascade of unintended consequences that ultimately affect our ability to meet the needs of people, or at least could affect the needs, our ability to meet the needs of people in future generations. And that, in fact, feedback on energy production and use. So really, the challenge of the 21st century is to meet these two goals together, meet the needs of people today and in the future while at the same time sustaining the atmosphere, water, climate, and ecosystems of the planet so that future generations really can have their needs met. So what's it going to take for that transition to sustainability? Um, and I say transition, by the way, because this is not going to be easy and it's not going to happen all at once and we're, we're taking baby steps along the way. What's it going to take? Well, it's going to take a bunch of things that we here in academic environments can, can help provide new knowledge, new technologies, tools, approaches, um, new approaches to making sure that that knowledge is in the hands of decision makers and the education of the public, as several of the speakers this morning talked about. But it's also going to need a lot of other things that everyone in this room can contribute to. And in fact, leadership by corporations um, has been leading the way, leadership by governments, leader, leadership by nonprofits and individual citizens and universities all matter. But what I'm going to talk about today is this first one. Um, what kinds of new knowledge, tools, and approaches do we need in order to make this transition to sustainability? And I'm going to be focusing the, on alternative energy. We heard a lot this morning about visions for, for our energy future, about the, the uh, engagement of new alternatives in that future. And in fact, we at Stanford and uh, many other places around the world work on a lot of those renewable energy sources, as well as alternatives within the fossil fuels, issues related to energy storage, transmission, and so on. And it's great that we're spending all this time and focus and, and energy on these challenges. Usually, though, what we look at and we, what we talk about anyway is the technology R&D related to them, and for good reason. We need to invest there. Um, when we talk about sustainability, usually we talk about both getting the energy needs for energy security purposes, but also reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change impacts. And that's, those two top uh, on that list are the main focus of our efforts. But I think we also, and many people are, beginning to focus on interactions across um, many other sectors of human activity and in, in many other areas of human need. So one of the challenges is to say, how do we do that? How do we actually, what kind of tools and approaches are available to us to begin to look not just at that, that interface between energy, new energy technologies and climate change, but beyond that. So what I'm going to do is give a, a little uh, short run through of a number of the different approaches that we are using, tools and methods and approaches we're using to ask that question, how can we engage in these new energy alternatives in ways that don't have negative consequences for all of these other things that people care about? How do we evaluate the trade-offs and co-benefits across those different options and across different areas of concern uh, to humans? So let me start, and I'm going to use biofuels as an example because they're actually a really interesting uh, way of, of talking about the, the um, state of play on some of these analyses and the, the needs for the future, but I'll, I'll verge into other uh, um, renewable energy as well. So um, probably the most important among the different ways to assess uh, the impacts, both the resource and the impacts of using a resource is through life cycle assessment. This is a tool that was developed in the sort of industrial e uh, ecology community and is widely used. Now, when biofuels came on the, on the uh, scene 
LCA was used primarily for looking at um, energy yield, net energy yield. Are these things worth it in terms of the energy produced? Um, but uh, in the early 2000s, when things really took off and biofuel bio, uh, production doubled in the United States, um, we began to worry more about the, the uh, non-energy impacts, impacts on greenhouse gases in particular. And we found that we really didn't have very much data on that. So I thought I'd throw in a, a slide here to say um, these assessments rely on good data, not just from the industrial parts of the process, but in, for in the case of biofuels, from the field-based parts of the process. So measurements of, of uh, net carbon exchange in ecosystems carried out by eddy co uh, covariance approaches are necessary. Um, Chamber-based measurements of other greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane are also necessary. And they need to be done in lots of different fields over long periods of time, multiple crop cycles and so forth, to really get an understanding of just how much um, greenhouse gas, gases are emitted during the conversion of these systems and during the operation of these biofuel systems. And you get data that looks something like that uh, with uh, the carbon equivalence emissions in the particular, different particular types of, of biofuel systems. Not easy to get those data. But over time, um, we've accumulated lots and lots of that kind of information, as well as the industrial ends of it. And so LCA is widely used, typically focused on net energy yields and greenhouse gases. And it uses uh, widely accessible published databases like the ones that uh, NREL and other organizations provide. But as we've worked along in this area, we've realized it's a lot more complicated than it looks on the surface. Um, we've learned, for example, that life cycle assessment of greenhouse gas emissions are sensitive to inputs and outputs in agricultural systems, and in particular to yields. So the carbon equivalent emissions per unit of energy produced are very sensitive to the yield of the crop. And yields vary, even within different crop types, a great deal. So we have to worry about that sensitivity. We've also realized that there's a lot of variation in feedstocks and in processing decisions uh, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions and in the treatment of, of co-products. So in this slide, this is looking at the DOE GREET model, a very commonly, widely used um, uh, LCA. And you can see, if, in looking at the blue graphs at the bottom, that there's a lot of variation even among the similar feedstocks. Um, and that has to do with the processing of those feedstocks. And that has to be incorporated in LCAs. And there's a whole other set of questions about, about allocation of greenhouse gas emissions when there are co-products involved. So for example, if, if corn mash is one of the co-products of a distillery process, who um, shouldn't some of the greenhouse gas emissions be accounted against that, against food for feed for animals and not just for energy production? So lots of, of, of complications that actually really matter in our ability to say, how well are we doing with this? There's also uh, a, a, um, a lot of work now that's been done on the issue of land use, previous land use, the land that, from which uh, biofuels were con are now uh, the land that is converted to biofuels. And you can see um, that different agricultural crops have different, uh, emit different amounts of greenhouse gases. In just about every case, if they're converted from other agricultural uses, other cropland, or from degraded sites, as shown in the red bar, um, the conversion costs are pretty minimum. We can pay back that carbon debt of converting the land to agriculture within a year. But if you convert land from forest, shown in the dark green bars, or, or woody savannas in the lighter green bars, uh, and convert those systems into biofuel systems, it takes a long time, decades, hundreds of years, um, maybe never, to, f to pay back the carbon debt um, of the carbon that is lost when land is converted from that natural vegetation type into biofuels. And these kinds of pieces of information are critical if we're really going to assess the uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with biofuels. 
Now, I want to just use palm oil as a great case study in that because, you know, uh, theoretically, palm oil should be a great biofuel. It has very high yields for very low inputs, so would make sense. However, a lot of the palm oil is uh, systems, uh, crop systems, are converted in tropical areas from forest or, um, or, or, or wetland type areas with a lot of peat. And that, in that conversion process, then a lot of greenhouse gases are emitted. So as this, this example from Indonesia shows, if you convert uh, palm oil, shown in yellow there, from forest, shown in green, um, you end up having very, very high greenhouse gas emissions, even though palm oil itself makes sense as a crop. Now, I wanted to throw in here, and this is actually was an issue that was raised earlier. Today, palm oil gets a lot of bad, uh, bad press uh, as a, as a um, biofuel, but in fact, most of these conversions of forest to palm oil are being done for food. And so it raises the question, shouldn't, maybe we should be doing life cycle analysis or assessments for food uses as well as for other things. And in fact, the conservation organizations are, are working in that direction. So that's talking about direct effects of, of land uh, from biofuel use, for biofuel use. But what about indirect effects? This is another really critical complication that, that we're trying to deal with in models. If land was previously used for food production is now used for biofuel production, other lands, someplace else, may have to be converted to agriculture to meet food demands. And then that leads to greenhouse gas emissions from those lands. That's an indirect land use. Everybody knows this happens, but the, um, there's huge de debate about the scenarios, assumptions, models, methods to in incorporate those indirect land use effects or whether we should even be doing it at all. And so very contentious area. But how is it done? Well, here we now use, we bring in um, general equilibrium models, macroeconomic models, to ask the question about how changes in, in demand for crops change prices and ultimately change land use in other areas. This is a GTAP model. Um, a very commonly used model for macroeconomic analysis that was then modified to use for biofuels. And I'll just explain really briefly what it's saying there. It's basically saying if we use two and a half million acres for, of land for corn ethanol production, um, ultimately we're going to end up needing to convert another 0.7 million acres worldwide for indirect, because of indirect uh, effects for, for food production. And what's the reasoning on that? Why isn't it one-to-one? -one? Well, there's tons of assumptions, basically, about how prices, change in prices affect um, the uh, demand for food, how changes in prices or changes in demand uh, in, impact efficiency of food production, and so on. And all of these assumptions are things that are, are debated in the literature. This kind of um, consequential LCA, it's called consequential life cycle assessment, is actually being used right now in setting regulations. And so I want to point this out. Um, this is an EPA uh, effort to um, set US, the renewable fuel standards. And they, uh, uh, by con congressional mandate, have to deal with this indirect land use effect, this consequential uh, indirect land use effect. And so how do they do it? Well, there's no one model that'll do it all. So they combine um, domestic economic modeling approaches together with domestic databases on emissions. So you can see at the top of those slides. And as well as international, you know, global trade models along with other kinds of, of databases that'll, that allow them to estimate emissions associated with the change in land use or livestock. And then at the bottom, the, the data according, that, uh, that accounts for the fuel and feedstock transport production and tailpipe emissions. So really pretty complicated model with a lot of uncertainties in it. And it is actually what is being used to um, develop regulations in the United States right now because of congressional mandate. Now, one, just one point I want to make about um, that model or that set of models and the analysis that they're doing. One take-home message is that it's going to be really hard for most of our biofuel systems 
to meet those standards. And you can see the, the red line for the conventional biofuels. But another take home message uh, that I have a circle around there, I think is really interesting. That one says, according to this analysis, when you in include indirect um, uh, effects of biofuels production, the uh, cellulosic, uh, cellulosic biofuels really come out on top. They really do the best. And in part, they do extremely well. And they're way below their threshold levels. They do extremely well because of, in a sense, cogen. They um, produce not only the <clears throat> ethanol, but they also produce the biofuel, but they also produce excess energy that can be fed into the grid and reduce emissions from other forms of electricity. So anyway, the point here is that these really complicated models are very interesting and very important in terms of asking questions about alternative decisions, but they're also actually being used in making rules. So that's LCA, and there's lots of other LCAs for every other alternative energy. You know, here's a picture of, of um, modeling for photovoltaics, but you could show LCAs for, uh, for geothermal, for carbon capture and storage based fossil fuel systems, for uh, hydro, and on and on. There's a lot of, of these are in use today. Um, but there's another way of looking at this and another way of studying this and another set of tools that are being every day used to understand the connections between energy decisions, economic decisions, and, and climate change. And that is um, really, uh, these models have originated in the global climate change, global change research communities, and they're called integrated assessment models. And they're done at the na international scale, global scale, although they are broken down into regions. Um, and they've been extremely useful in climate change research because they allow us to ask questions about uh, different trajectories of energy use, population growth, and so forth, and its potential impacts on greenhouse gas emissions and climate change over the long run. So you know, the, all of the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Projections of Climate Change, use these models of economics and energy to drive them. So, um, and I, there's a, a long list of them. I've listed some of them, including the MERGE model, which is the EPRI integrated assessment model. And uh, John Wyant and the Energy Modeling Forum at Stanford have been one of the key places that these models have been uh, used and compared and uh, coupled with climate models to get future projections. Okay, but there's another example of looking at energy decisions and climate. So I started asking the question, what, do you, what about beyond that? You know, this is really critical. Getting the greenhouse gases right is really critical. But what about when we want to worry about freshwater resources or food production or human health concerns or biodiversity or all the other things that people today and in the future will need in order to survive? How do, we, how do we evaluate that? What kind of models and tools are available to us for that? Um, well, let's take a look at water first. Fresh water has been really hard to in, embed in the life cycle analysis, um, in part because it's very situational. Um, what seems like an awful lot of water to use in one place because water is scarce uh, will be insignificant in another place where there's a lot of water, et cetera. So how, do, how is that managed? This is, a, by the way, a graph from um, uh, Dan Kamen and Fingerman and others at, at Berkeley showing the, basically the fact that different crops use different amounts of water. Different crops also use different amounts of fertilizers and therefore have different effluents, different pollution uh, affecting water quality. So how do you incorporate, incorporate that in our assessments of um, in, our, in making good choices. Well, they suggest that we really need uh, improved freshwater accounting approaches that are very much like LCAs. In fact, our L LCAs, <clears throat> but especially for water resources. And there are uh, some examples out there of doing this for other crops, like cotton and other, other crops that may or may not be active in the biofuels world right now. Um, but the same kind of assessment is going to be extremely important for for example, um, a whole range of solar options. Solar thermal right now, large-scale solar 
uh, ha is, is very worried about water use. But have we done a very careful assessment of the, all of the sort of life cycle use of solar for water? Not really, nor have we compared it yet to, uh, um, to alternatives. So that's a, an area for future work. What about f food? It is very clear that if you go back to the biofuels example, more demand for cropland should theoretically lead to higher agricultural product prices. And there you see a, a bunch of the of, um, pretty basic economic theory that says prices should go up. And we have a whole bunch of um, quite sophisticated uh, general equilibrium models that show indeed food prices do go up when you have increasing demand for biofuels. How much they go up varies. I apologize for the slide. I don't really want you to read it all, but other than to see there's a lot of people working on this question. And there's not complete agreement on exactly what happens, but food prices go up. But what Roz Naylor and, and others here at Stanford have pointed out is that what is really, you know, the really critical questions here are not whether food prices go up per se, but what that means to people, especially people in developing uh, countries. Higher prices are certainly bad for the urban poor who have to buy those food commodities as they try to survive. But is it possible that higher prices could actually be good for the rural poor who could take advantage of the um, increased markets for their commodities? And in order to answer that question, um, they say we need integrated dynamics models of the type that we don't really have in hand right now. I will say, um, I was going to take the slide out, but I will say that there are models out there right now that are beginning to look at uh, impacts in social systems, in human, in coupled human environment systems. And so one should be able to connect those economic models and, you know, food models with social models like this vulnerability assessment here in order to ask that, answer that question. Who wins and who loses because of those changes in food prices? But right now, um, that's not something that we're, we're able to do. We are able, though, and we're seeing more and more of these kinds of examples coming out, we're able to link the energy and economic models, those economic-based models, with global land use and water use models, with ecosystem models that estimate carbon turnover and productivity, and with climate models to begin to look at trade-offs, or at least conflicts, uh, among food, water, and fuel needs in different parts of the world. There's a German group whose work I just saw um, that uh, it does a really wonderful job of using a number of different um, dynamic models to, to conclude, basically, that we, there won't be much in the way, if, if we have biofuels worldwide, there wouldn't be much in the way of conflict for food, water, or fuel if we just did it everywhere. But if we set aside lands, we protect lands for the other values like biodiversity or tourism or indigenous groups or whatever, when we include those, we start seeing really serious conflicts. And it raises questions about some of our projections for biofuels as the answer, part of the answer for the future. And if we go back now to the integrated modeling world of the, of the global change community, we see a similar kind of trend, a trend of linking different kinds of models, linking the economic models in red there, the climate models and earth system models in blue, and the impacts and vulnerability type models in, uh, I guess, pink. Um, and they're getting more and more and more complicated as we go. One thing that nobody really is able to engage in very, very well right now is biodiversity impacts, although there's a bunch of different attempts to do so. What are the biodiversity impacts of different choices we make about energy? Um, and one of the reasons this is hard to do is that there's a lot that's not known about biodiversity, and also it's very hard to place values on biodiversity, so it's hard to bring them into these kinds of assessments. But let me give you an example or two of, of some of the ways people have been trying to do it. Um, this is an example from a Swiss group. It's a life cycle assessment um, that goes beyond the greenhouse ga gas emissions and, and brings in several other metrics of, uh, that, that focus on ecosystem and human health uh, aspects. 
So uh, there's an Eco Indicator 99, which is, a, I think, a, um, a German group, no, a, a European Union group, and the UBP 06 is a, is a um, Swiss group. And these are just, these are indicator systems, metrics that include um, concerns not just about greenhouse gases, but other things like land degradation and conversion, human health issues, air pollution, and so on. The interesting thing about these metrics, or in comparisons of these metrics, is that um, the answers that you get if you just look at an ass assessment of greenhouse gases, shown over there on the left, um, may be different than the answers you get if you look at those other variables of, of interest that are included in their, in their indicators. So uh, in these bars, we're looking at everything, anything that's uh, a, a larger bar, a longer bar, uh, than those gray ones on the bottom, which are, is, is uh, fossil fuel based, um, are bad. And anything that's shorter is good. And you can see there's a whole lot of biofuels on the left-hand side that are, are better than um, petroleum in, in terms of global warming potential. That's not a surprise. But when you look over at the other indicators, indicators that, that focus on other values other than just climate, you see that not all of them are good. In fact, all of the yellow ones um, are, are not good at all. So the lesson from this is that um, is not that we won't use any of these biofuels. It's that decision makers need to make choices recognizing that choices for greenhouse gas emission reductions aren't always good choices for other issues at hand. Um, the other lesson from this analysis, which I think you probably can't read, but I'll tell you, is that the winners, all those across the top that have dramatic um, you know, low values, basically, compared to fo fossil fuels across the board, those are all bio waste, manure, other kinds of wood waste, uh, uh, cooking oil waste, and so forth. Those seem to be the winners when you care more than, uh, more than just greenhouse gases. OK, moving on, another approach that I think is, is uh, has huge benefits is uh, our approaches that attempt to um, systematically evaluate across a whole bunch of different criteria as we're trying to plan for uh, alternative uh, energy systems, biofuel systems in this case, where you basically map the, the, try to map ultimately the land that is going to be best for biofuels and has the fewest conflicts with other things we need, like food or biodiversity conservation sites or so forth. Um, and that's an example, this is an example from the uh, FAO funded study in Tanzania. Here's another example of a, of a study in um, uh, Kenya. And again, basically, you identify the places where there's good food production going on, take them out of the, out of the game, identify the places for biofuel, I mean, for conservation protection, take that out of the game, and then avoid those areas and focus on areas where you can get good biofuels crops. Now, these uh, mapping exercises have been um, done in a lot of different places, or a number of different places anyway. They tend to be donor funded. And one really interesting question is, does anybody ever use them? Or do they go on a shelf somewhere? Are they actually used and useful by decision makers who are trying to identify locations for, in this case, biofuel production? That, that mapping perspective can be taken to the global scale. Here's work done by Chris Field and David LaBelle and others. Um, uh, and in trying to identify abandoned agricultural lands globally, Again, with the idea that we should avoid lands where food is being produced, avoid lands where conservation is important, avoid other kinds of lands that we care about for other purposes, and focus on those degraded agricultural lands that are just right for this. And what they find is, yeah, there, there's a lot of them out there. We could produce some of our, some of our, our energy needs that way. But it, it also allows us to actually calculate how much that is. And it certainly isn't going to solve the problem. So mapping has been, I think, and is a key element of, of a lot of approaches now for citing renewables. Um, and you know, let me give you a quick example. Uh, in a particular project, a siting project for wind or for solar or for something else, biofuels, first thing 
that can be done now quite strength, straightforwardly thanks to uh, NREL and other groups' uh, databases identify renewable energy resources. Here's one for solar. And then identify areas that are protected for other purposes, for conservation or other purposes. Um, and here are some examples of maps that come from NRDC and from Audubon that indicate places that are already set aside or should be set aside because they're important corridors for biodiversity, uh, for, for plants and animals to migrate and so forth. Um, identify sites that are, are already degraded and therefore you know, no problem actually to get access to them and, and no harm from using them. And here's sites, um, this is from an EPA renewable energy mapping tool that identifies sites like from solid waste um, uh, systems. And you can go on down the list, and I won't show you them all, but maps that identify land ownership and access, transmission access, and, and in the end, you can put together a pretty good picture of the best places to focus your efforts on. Here's an example that my, my co-author, Ian Monroe, was involved in, which the San Bernardino County uh, Solid Waste uh, Management um, uh, Group asked for an assessment of, for, for renewable energy in their areas. And, First of all, a map that identifies the, the different uh, land ownership areas, some of which would be hands off to this and some of which might actually be good places for, the, for um, renewable energy. And again, the solar assessment from NREL, a wind assessment from NREL. And then once you begin to narrow it down, you can begin to look at uh, specific site constraints and identify areas you know, that might be great for wind or solar or roads or whatever else, but have archaeological sites nearby that, that can't be disturbed or other, you know, other things like that. So again, just a spatial um, uh, assessment approach that allows decision makers to, uh, to identify the best places, um, the places for potential development. And the idea is if you get that part right, then everything else that comes after that for siting projects, which I think many of you in this room know is incredibly hard to do, um, becomes easier and faster because you got, you got as much as you could get right at the very beginning. Okay, so I think what, what uh, we have then are a number of different approaches, um, mapping and models and LCA and so forth that allow us a good accounting of the current situation. Um, but I think what a lot of these do is miss other opportunities that are not so obvious to us right now, that are not so apparent to us, not right in front of our eyes. And this kind of modeling um, is possible. It could be done through ecosystem services assessments. So let me tell you about ecosystem services assessments. Uh, first of all, let me tell you what ecosystem services are. Um, we all know that we get lots of goods from nature. We get seafood, we get food that's grown in agricultural systems, forest products, and so forth. Those are, those are things we all recognize we get. But there are a lot of other things, a lot of other goods and services that we get from our environment, our natural ecosystems, that we use. We can store carbon in forests and other types of systems. Watersheds provide clean drinking water. We have flood protection and sediment control because of the way natural ecosystems line coastlines. Um, we also get a bunch of cultural values. Values um, mat matter a lot to me. Recreation, tourism, a sense of place, a love for these, these hills outside of Stanford, and so forth. And then we also have options for the future that we get from our, our ecosystems. Um, one example is biodiversity. Most of our pharmaceuticals have come from um, plants, animals, and microbes in natural forests and other, and, you know, other ecosystems around the planet, and we want to have access to those in the future. So we've got all these different services. We tend not to account for them at all. So one of the things that these ecosystem assessment tools try to do, um, and these are tools really designed for corporations and, and other decision makers. They try to develop uh, approaches to, um, to give decision makers information about potential services on the lands that they're trying to decide how to use. I say lands, but it could be water systems, oceans, and so on. Lots of different types, but I'm going to tell you really quickly 
about the INVEST model, the one in the, the top of the list there. INVEST is uh, a set of economic and ecosystem and hydrologic models um, developed by the Natural Capital Project here at Stanford. Gretchen Daly leads this, but it's a partnership between Stanford and other, uh, the, the, the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. And they have developed these tools and are using them in China and California and Africa, but I'll give you one example from Hawaii. How does it work? Well, they worked with Kamehameha Schools, the largest landowner in Hawaii, to try to identify um, good decisions, good choices about how they should use a big piece of land on Oahu that was uh, about to be uh, come up for, for a new lease. And what did they do? They first of all mapped the current land cover. They developed with the stakeholders there, with the landowners, a number of potential scenarios for how that land could be used for biofuels, for residential, for sustainable agriculture and forestry, or for forest products. And then they ran um, those scenarios, they ran their models using those scenarios and, and um, provided some insight into the services that th that land could provide. So here's one service, carbon storage. This is a really important issue when we talk about climate change. Um, how do those different land uses affect carbon storage? And you have biofuels being not very good for carbon storage, subdivisions not being very good, agriculture and forestry being much better for that particular service. And they went through this process for a whole bunch of different services, not just carbon storage, water quality, water yield, and a bunch of others. And they basically were able to give the decision makers information about how their, these different scenarios affected these different services, some of which provide money to the landowners. Now, it doesn't make a decision for them. It just gives them information with which to make decisions based on their own values. And I think that those kinds of ecosystem services models actually provide a wonderful, um, maybe additional tool that could be used as we think about siting um, renewable energy sites. Um, because it allows us to ask questions about, you know, if we do this today, will it get in the way of other things that might actually pay off for us in the future? So all of these tools that I've been talking about are more, in one way or the other, stakeholder-based tools. They're all for decision-making. They're decision support tools. But there's also a bunch of processes that have been studied and developed. Um, in which to engage stakeholders more completely in the, in the decision making and in the development of information process. One pretty neat example is the California Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative, RETI, you may have seen that, it's going on. Um, it's a stakeholder process for expanding renewable energy resources and transmission uh, to go with them. And um, interesting here, thing here is that the, they use experts to develop Again, the, the zones where alternative re renewable energy options are, are strong. And then they also, though, have expert groups who um, rate those different areas in terms of their environmental score, not just how much energy is going to be produced, but, but what the environmental consequences will be. And then another set of stakeholders and experts who rate them in terms of cost. And from that kind of a stakeholder-based analysis, you can come up with graphs like this. The size of the ball is the energy source, energy resource basically, the net energy yield potential from them. And you can see that there are some places up there on the corner, the right hand corner of the, the, of the graph that have a lot of energy potential, but they also have very high environmental concerns and they also have very high costs. So that's kind of a no brainer, not there, don't go there, but there are other areas as you see down in the, um, the lower left of the, of the graph, where there's you know, really good energy resources with relatively low environmental costs and relatively low economic costs, and maybe that's where the, the focus should go. So it's a great stakeholder process. I think it's a state of the art um, for, for stakeholder engagement in these really, really challenging decisions. And there are other stakeholder processes I'll just mention here that in the biofuels wor world, the sustainable biofuels roundtables are hugely important in bringing the different actors, the, the corporations, the environmental groups, the water resource people, et cetera, et cetera, 
into the discussion in order to set standards that make sense for all of those um, different goals. Okay, so what I've done in my hour is uh, presented a whole bunch of different tools and approaches that we have right now for evaluating unintended consequences of, of alternatives, of choices that we might make. Um, these are all actually in infancy. They haven't been around for more than a couple of decades. So that's in, it's an interesting point. There's, it seems right now like there's a lot more to do, but they're also useful even as they are today. And so there's, uh, I think, quite a bit of excitement in the research community about developing these kinds of tools. But, um, and, I'm, and by the way, this isn't a complete list. There, there are others. But I think there's also, it's also really important to remember this, that these models are only going to be as good as their assumptions and their data, and they could be really wrong especially if you don't engage decision makers. I don't know how many of you have read this book called The Fires. <coughs> it is a, it's about uh, the use of some RAND models for New York City for siting of their uh, fire stations, and it's a really a story of disaster in the 1960s and, and 1970s and fire in New York. And it's an example of what happens when these you know, whiz-bang, wonderful models get used without really uh, checking the data and the assumptions and without really engaging the decision makers who, who actually are going to um, be able to use them on the ground. So in the future then, where does that leave us? Um, again, this is an exciting area for research. There's a ton to be done, but I know there's a lot of you in the room who would like to see some of these tools um, be useful and usable so that you can actually use them right now, and some of them are. Um, I think that the, the drive in all, across all of these, from the, from the local scale or sectoral scale or individual you know, energy source scale, all the way to these global assessment models, is integration, connecting them, so that we know more about how our decisions affect things that we care about. And that requires connecting different kinds of models. Um, there's more and more focus down in scale to local and regional scales where a lot of decisions are made. Um, there's um, an in increased interest in not only giving decision makers information about the consequences or impacts of decisions, but tools to help them make trade-offs, even though ultimately trade-offs are based on the values they hold. And a big deal on incorporating uncertainty analysis, which becomes even more important when you start linking and connecting models of different types and from different research communities. Um, there's also, I think, a, the critical need for more focus on decision support. How do you actually um, connect in all of the research that you know, many of us do in this room to decision making? What points? And it's, uh, I call this knowledge systems research. How and at what points can, can these kinds of tools be most useful to decision making? Another point, and again, this was raised in, in the discussion with Dr. Johnson, um, the need for assessment across all sectors of, of human activity, not just energy. The fact is that energy and food and water are connected tightly with each other. The boundaries between them are very, very fuzzy. And so doing something like a life cycle analysis for biofuels automatically goes into the food sector. Maybe if we did food as well as we're trying to do energy, um, and maybe if we did other human activities as well as we're trying to do energy, uh, we would be better off. And then finally, I think there's much more uh, need for explicit learning by doing. Um, we are trying these. We are in the midst of these experiments, and we are using some of these models that I've talked about, some of these assessment approaches, to try to help us make better decisions. How well is it working? Are we willing to say when something didn't really work very well at all? And can we learn uh, from the experience of doing? So thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to take questions or discussion. Okay, we have our roaming students, so if you'll put them up, I'll be happy to recognize the ones that want to ask questions. I think I took you down into the weeds after those earlier talks today, but it's, it's, it's actually pretty important to figure out how to do this. Just 
one in, in front here. Kind of disease. Pam, that was very interesting. And what struck me was that there are so many different models that interact with each other, and each of these models have their own underlying assumptions and based on um, data that are perhaps inaccurate. And so I can, as a person who spent his life modeling, yes. I can understand the uh, unintended consequences of using these models. Right. Uh, and also the difficulty of using these models. So I think perhaps we also need to make some effort on integrating these models and making them easily usable, perhaps in a way that computer games are used. Right. So that uh, different individuals from different communities can have access and they can perhaps be given options and the relative uh, merits of those options in making decisions. You know, your, your point is absolutely right on. They're, they're so complicated. There's, so there's two concerns. One is that they're so complicated that they can be wrong. And that's why we better be learning as we go and improving them. We better be focusing on uncertainty analysis, and we're not, all those kinds of things. But in, in many ways, having at least some perspective on this is better than having none at all. And that's where the simplified tools could become very important. There are games that are, are used in other resource decisions that people make. Um, games, for example, that allow uh, communities to look at their future in terms of should we do, how should we develop, how should we, um, should we do, do more tourism, should we protect our lakes in different ways, and so forth. And, and those tools are also in their infancy, but they're really good stakeholder engagement, and they're simplified. So they become not, well, none of these are the answer. All of these are hopefully just going to help the decision makers get a little bit more insight into the things that they're worrying about. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, the, uh, I think that the, the decision support tools uh, is, a, is an area of research. Actually, we, we call for a, a great increase in research in that, in this climate report that I was involved in, because that's where it's at, getting decision makers to see the issues. So, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that, that wonderful talk. Uh, where was this published, this uh, plot that you, you showed versus uh, environmental cost and economic cost for various counties in, in California, including Imperial and Riverside? Do you have a citation on that? Yeah, that, uh, let's see, I've got the website for that anyway. Do you, Ian, do you know where that, whether they can find that any place other than online? Uh, yeah. Oh, online would be just fine, thank you. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll get the I reference. Can, I've got the I've got it, the thank website you. too. Thank you very much. I should have put was it on the slide. Was that a recent uh, study? Yes, it's it is. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, uh, assuming Pam agrees, her slides will be uh, on the website for this uh, uh, for the GSEP website. Well, and I need to go back and put that website address on that slide. Okay. Uh, so. uh, there was one over here. And there's one back. Where to go? Uh, right over there. Yeah, uh, yeah among the uh, list of models. I noticed there was a title certification. Yes. Uh, would you please uh, elaborate on this? Yes. Certification requires a determining agency to certify. So therefore, there is no uncertainty there. Well, that's right. There are a number of um, certification schemes for, for biofuels, for example, but also for a lot of other resource needs that we, resource uses that we have. Uh, usually the certification schemes are done by stakeholder groups who try to bring together all of the perspectives. They're pretty important. You know, one example is the, um, is the uh, forest products uh, certification. Um, one of the things that's allowed uh, consumers to know that they're buying wood that has been sustainably grown versus cleared out of some, you know, old growth tropical forest someplace. Um, and, and those certification schemes are developed not by any one government agency saying this is the right thing, but by stakeholder groups who get together in a, um, a, a very credible process 
and lay out the issues that they think are most important for, for that certification. But certification is one of the big challenges right now, I think. We, I just was involved in a National Academy report on, on the challenges of developing good long-term certification programs because people are making decisions based on whether or not they're going to be certified. Um, so how do we incorporate new knowledge, new information into certification schemes uh, while at the same time giving the decision makers uh, some sense of, of long-term you know, playing fields with, in, with respect to them. But they're really important, I think, for a lot of those things where there isn't just you know, one index that says this is good or this is bad, brings lots of perspectives to bear on it. So one more. Very interesting talk, Pam. You know, uh, you describe a, a world of very complex tools needed to evaluate the very important questions of how our choices in energy and dealing with climate change are gonna, could affect other resources and other things that are important to us, water resources, food production resources, et cetera. As you listened to the two talks earlier today, yeah. uh, the trajectory that the U.S. is planning to take or wanting to take and that China the two, two of the biggest players in the global energy and climate change scene. Uh, what, uh, from what you know of the assessments that have been done to date, are the big ticket items that you would have concern about, of, uh, about un unintended consequences of the trajectories that you see for the U.S. and for China? Well, it's a really good question. As I listen to those speakers today, I'm you know, com completely with them. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, you know, sort of scenarios for our future, that vision for our future, I think we could meet them, but we will, um, we will have serious regrets if we do it without worrying about the social and environmental consequences. So, I mean, I think one of the big ones is water resources. Uh, it is a huge challenge worldwide, and um, across the board, our, our different approaches are going to affect wa how water resources are used, so we need to bring them into the mix. Um, I think also, well, obviously, I think food is really critical too. But uh, you know, I think we ought to be thinking about food from a from an assessment point of view too, and making sure that we're making food decisions that are good for energy and vice versa. And we're nowhere near that, so it's a heat, but we need it. Well, thanks, Pam, for a great talk. Please join okay, me. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.